Good morning, everyone. I open he the hearing number nine of the 185th of the period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is called Border Policies and Protection of the Human Rights of Persons in Human Mobility, which was requested ex officio by the Inter-American Commission. My name is Julissa Mantilla. I am the president of the commission, and I'm here with the first vice president, Commissioner Estuardo Rallon, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, Rapporteur for Rights of Persons in Mobility, and Commissioner Carlos Bernal. We're also having with us Maria Claudia Polido, Assistant Secretary for Monitoring. I want to thank civil society organizations for the presence, and I will uh, explain the distribution of time. We will have 40 minutes for the organizations. As I understand, you have already organized yourselves with four minutes each. Then we will participate for 25 minutes. And finally, we'll have the final comments for 25 minutes. Having said this, I give the floor to civil society organizations. Thank you very much. I give the floor to civil society representatives. And also I wanted to greet uh, rapporteur, special rapporteur Soledad Garcia Munoz. I'm already seen here on screen. Civil society, you have the floor. Hello, good morning. I'm sorry. We wanted to thank commissioners for having requested, having convened this uh, hearing. My name is Gabriela Ligori. I'm representing the um, Center for Legal and Social Studies in Argentina to present the situation in our country, Argentina. In our country, as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, the national branch de decreed the, the closure of borders until 2021 without establishing any sort of exceptions to protect the rights of persons that needed international protection out of uh, humanitarian reasons or family reasons or to protect uh, children. All these situations are reflected in a report in detail, which was um, issued by CAREF and the OHCHR on families in mobility to Argentina in 2020 and 2021. Clearly, during this period, the mobility continued and that led to persons entering the country in a, a non-regular manner. Over at that period, there were several measures implemented that were modified along the way. For example, in the absence of authorities in borders to request international protection, there was a mechanism, an online mechanism implemented that was uh, taken down later on and that made impossible for persons with the need of protection to request asylum as refugees for any by any means given this um a complaint on the part of civil society this was re-established but right now this is only a form to enter data but not more than that so the current situation is that persons that have entered the country irregularly during the pandemic have most of them have uh, have a document uh, and they are threatened of expulsion after a dialogue with the national directorate of migrations we managed to uh, see case by case but there is no formal mechanism that may allow all persons that have entered irregularly during this period to access both to the request of uh, asylum in a proper way or access to uh, 
regular mechanism that may uh, address the exceptionality of the conditions in which they enter the uh, country. I give the floor to Diego Morales of CELS, who will continue with our uh, intervention. Thank you very much, commissioners. It's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity. I only have 30 seconds left, so I will say this very briefly. The current situation in borders continues to be very delicate in Argentina. There are no mechanisms in place in borders to request the uh, asylum as refugees. This is something we want to focus on. Secondly, there are no mechanisms for legal protection at borders, uh, nor any means to address this. It's necessary to consider a habeas corpus at this moment. The law in Argentina provides some provisions, but this is not clearly defined. And finally, a situation which has to do with uh, rejections of Argentinians uh, in Mexico's airports. Thank you very much. We will continue uh, later on. We give the floor to other organizations. Madam President, the uh, Servicio Jesuita Migrante in Chile, I I'm here on behalf of them. Thank you for the opportunity. We wanted to make visible in Chile two problems. Ever since uh, February 2020, there is a new migration law in place, which incorporates a new uh, procedure of expulsion at borders, which is called reconstruction procedure, which includes um, addressing uh, false documents, for example. According to the information that we have gathered uh, by the police in Chile, there have been more than 3,000 processes of expulsion in Chile and 83% of them of these procedures affected Venezuelans, Venezuelan nationals, and 7% to Bolivia and to Colombian nationals. However, only 9.5% have uh, been implemented and only 96% of Venezuelan nationals have not been uh, uh, have not been affected by this finally because these persons were left in a very vulnerable situation since they um, since they are threatened by an order of expulsion, but they are not protected by court, so they have to enter the country once again in other non-official uh, crossings, uh, putting their lives at, at risk, and then they live here, which with this in this un, non-regular situation. This, uh, then, as regards the policy at borders, there have been there has been a great decrease of uh, requests for asylum. In 2019, there had been more than 16,000 requests to enter uh, uh, Chile with uh, a request for asylum. And right now, there are only 12 requests. So we would like to say that there is a debt on the part of the state of Chile towards protecting human rights of persons in mobility that come through border crossings regardless of the time of the of the type of um, of the means they use there is no protection of those persons and there is a set of rights according to this new law which is not a complied with the right to an interpreter or to have contact with their uh, families or to have a defense none of that is complied with. And also there's a lack of knowledge and expertise of officials at borders to identify cases and possible victims of human trafficking that also are on the rise in my country, according to the data of the Observatory of Human Mobility in Chile. This is especially concerning in my country as regards the public debate, because migration debates are specifically focused on uh, issues of security because uh, there are uh, bills that only focus on expulsions and how those and the small progress that we have made 
is not complied with as regards uh, expulsion. Uh, that is what we wanted to make visible. We want to request respectfully, respectfully from the commission and the rapporteurship if there could be an, a release to call states to address all these concerns and problems and also to have a regional report on the problems that may be presented here at this hearing. And I want to thank the opportunity to share our experience. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners, uh, executive secretariat and civil society organizations. We thank you for allowing us to participate at this year. My name is Maria Camila Vega of the National Federation of uh, Colombia and Camila Becerra is next to me. Uh, and we are representing the uh, an organization made up of 15 organizations that work for human rights of persons in mobility in Colombia. Our intervention has to do with the systematic uh, infringement of the right to request asylum in transit areas or other areas on the part of the state of Colombia. This has to do with the fact that the legal system does not regulate the situation and there are contradictory situations which create confusion as regards um, the organizations that are in charge of recognizing these status, the status of refugees of persons in transit. Even though if a person is crossing a border or is using an airport and they may request ref, ref, um, asylum, the migration organizations may not receive this request by persons in trans transit. So in the area of the airport of Bogota, the organizations involved are re rejecting requests for asylum to students. So there is a legal provision to reject persons and borders. This means that they uh, give back persons to their countries, ignoring the fact that the territory of the state also includes transit areas and tr airports, and that the non refoulement principle presupposes these indirect, the, the, the prohibition of this indirect uh, refusal. We have seen that migration organizations, uh, authorities usually retain documents of these persons without giving any justification to airlines so that they may go back to their territories, the territories they come back. They, they come from. We have seen uh, infringements to uh, access to translator, to free movement, and to other rights. Also, detained persons are not guaranteed their satisfaction of minimum needs to food, to access to bathrooms, or changing of clothes, or dignified and human conditions as regards uh, personal integrity. We also see that this has been uh, worsened with the pandemic restrictions. We have identified cases of non-admission in transit areas around the El Dorado airport of Cuban, Ven Venezuelan and African people, for example, from Egypt, uh, Somalia and Eritrea, among other countries. And this is a violation to the non refoulement principle, which impacts specifically persons coming from these territories where there are public uh, situations that affect the protection of human rights in a massive manner. Also, in view of the humanitarian crisis in Colombian borders, this is extremely concerning because there is a violation of the non refoulement principle and also of a possible case of discrimination based on nationalities. So we repeat that the Inter-American System on Human Rights has stated several times that states cannot intervene in, in this access to territory to refuse access to international protection. That access must be guaranteed through the non-rejection at borders, prohibition to a massive expulsions and the non-migration detainment which are more severe if they are done in a, in such situation as the ones that we are seeing today. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Madam President and distinguished commissioners. We wanted to thank the opportunity to speak of the crisis on the Dominican Republic and Haiti border exacerbated by the migration policy of our government. First of all, we see the volume of um, land expulsions without due process increase. In 2021, thousands of Haitians were deported. 627 out of those were pregnant women, according to official figures. In 2022, this figure has almost doubled with more than 85,000 deportations. And this number leads us to, to see that it's impossible to comply with due process. Besides calling to stop this in the face of humanitarian crisis impact in Haiti, there have been thousands of detain detentions without informing family members. The government of the Dominican Republic reported with pride that in September there was a record of deportations. Only during the first six days of October, more than 4,000 migrants were deported. So to achieve this record, all states' instruments have been mobilized without taking into account their competence or jurisdiction. Detained persons and witnesses have reported that military officers that are not part of the specialized uh, border security body have participated in operations related to migration this last few months. This exposes people to arbitrary detention. Police do not have the capacity to carry out administrative detentions. So we advocate so that police and military offic officials are excluded of uh, migration processes. Their use in such detentions erodes their trust, the people's trust in them, and diminishes the possibility of migrants resorting to the police to report any sort of crime or violence they might have suffered. We have seen in 2021 that the government of Luisa Vinaven introduced a series of migration control measures that is, are extremely worrying, including deportation of persons that are not, that should not be deported according to the Dominican legislation, including pregnant women and children and adolescents. Among the violations that have been uh, committed lately, we see the specific warrant to capture and expel people, especially in the last part of 2021, which constitutes an act of discrimination against women on the basis of their status as pregnant and uh, foreigners, in this case, Haitians. Most women have been detained in hospitals while they were seeking medical assistance for them and their children. In the last five months, civil society organizations that support migrants have reported that they, this, um, this things, the situations in hospitals are, um, a, are on decline, but they are still detaining these persons. Persons have been detained without leaving them the right to access their documentation despite being eligible to asylum, to, to seek asylum. This happens because the national plan for regularization has been frozen by the government and resident permits are not renewed for persons that had uh, acquired them in 2014. Authorities start the deportation process even when the detained person has the, the permit that has expired and they show the birth certificates. The state does not recognize nor consider specific needs of protection of persons that come from Haiti. We have observed the lack of recognition 
that these persons may have specific needs of protection in virtue of the political and humanitarian crisis that we see prevailing in our neighboring country. The latest declarations by the president may be interpreted as not wanting to accept um, refugees coming in a massive manner with prima facie detentions, none from Haiti and none from any other area, despite the crisis that we are seeing today. Also during the dialogues regarding borders in October, people have reported that persons with the need of severe protection have have come to the country without any protection. And there is a report that reads that more hundred, uh, that thousands of persons were detained in their attempt to cross the Dominican Republic border. Authorities do not ask on their need of protection when they detain them. The border inhabitant uh, concept is something that is not addressed either. The 2004 law creates this status to identify persons that cross the border uh, day on a daily basis to work. In 2021, the National Directorate of Migration issued a resolution to uh, get rid of this concept. So they do not, they did not issue 35 permits. This program was suspended in February 2021 on the basis of the instability that the for, the neighboring country is going through and other conditions that are have not been studied so far. So once again, the government has uh, gotten rid of such a regulation that could be in line with the protection of this person's immobility. However, migration has not stopped and the government is planning building a border wall in this case. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. I'd like to thank the Commission on behalf of the Caribbean Center for Human Rights for this opportunity to highlight uh, the border policies implemented by Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago is a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 Protocol. Trinidad and Tobago established a draft national policy to address refugee and asylum matters in 2014, but that has not been integrated into local legislation as yet. Under the draft refugee policy, a framework was established to provide guidance on how to treat asylum seekers and refugees. This phased approach towards the establishment of a national policy articulated the transition of a refugee status determination from UNHCR to the Immigration Division of Trinidad and Tobago. The government of Trinidad and Tobago continues to disregard its international obligations under the 1951 Refugee Convention and place persons seeking international protection in Trinidad and Tobago at risk. Trinidad and Tobago continues to return asylum seekers, which may constitute reform law. And CCHR has received reports of persons registered with UNHCR also being returned. Because of a lack of a national refugee policy, asylum seekers are treated under the Immigration Act of 1976. Anyone found entering the country is charged with illegal entry detained and either released after a bond is paid and issued an order of supervision, which allows them to stay in the country until their claim is processed or they are deported to their country of origin. Persons released on an order of supervision are also required to report to immigration division on a monthly basis. The Immigration Act does not recognize the non-penalization principle of the Refugee Convention. State policies are not applied consistently as some persons are returned to their country of origin after they have been detained and charged with illegal entry, which co conflicts with Trinidad and Tobago's obligations to honor the principles of non refoulement and non penalization. Additionally, in June 2019, the government of Trinidad and Tobago established 
a visa requirement for Venezuelans wishing to enter Trinidad and Tobago. The establishment of a visa requirement has further challenged their ability to seek international protection in Trinidad and Tobago. Given the situation in Venezuela, passports are difficult to obtain and obtaining a visa may prove difficult for some who may need to flee urgently. Trinidad and Tobago returns migrants and asylum seekers on an, on an ongoing basis through various strategies. Migrants and asylum seekers who are intercepted at sea are, escort, are escorted out of Trinidad, Trinidad's waters or detained, quarantined, and then deported. The 1951 Refugee Convention commits states to waive the penalty for irregular entry for asylum seekers. How Trinidad, however, the Trinidad and Tobago government continues to issue deportation orders for irregular entry without conducting individualized assessment to ascertain protection needs and their particular vulnerabilities. The most extreme example by the state, presumably in an effort to deter migrants and asylum seekers entering Trinidad and Tobago, occurred in February of this year, where the Coast Guard fired shots at a boat, which resulted in the death of a one-year-old Venezuelan boy. His mother was also injured. The Coast Guard claimed they feared for their lives as the much smaller and slower boat in which the migrants were traveling in tried to hit the high-speed vessel that the Coast Guard were in. An investigation was launched after this incident. However, to date, the public is unaware of what progress has been made with this, with this investigation. For the month of August, it was reported that 56 persons were returned to Venezuela. Of that number, 11 persons, including one minor, were registered or pre-registered with UNHCR. Some may have been voluntary from the information we received but of course, information needs to be confirmed. For September, for CETES for September, 24 persons who were returned to Venezuela, sorry, for, 20, for September, 24 persons were returned to Venezuela. There are two others who may have been returned to Venezuela, but the voluntariness of that particular return needs to be assessed and the information needs to be confirmed. The government of Trinidad and Tobago continues to return persons on an ongoing basis with, a, with an incomplete assessment of their needs and without the knowledge of stakeholders. Engage in the response to migrants and refugees in Trinidad and Tobago. Thus, persons that may be in need of international protection are deported before civil society has any knowledge of their presence on Trinidad and Tobago's soil. Immigration detention policies and procedures are of grave concern for CCHR. The government of Trinidad and Tobago continues to detain persons indefinitely without sufficient legal basis and charge persons under the outdated Immigration Act. Migrants and asylum seekers caught entering the country irregular, irregularly are placed in a quarantine facility at the detention facility at the heliport in Chagaramas. Mainly Venezuelan migrants and asylum seekers are held there. We have received reports that the, the detention facility in Chagaramas is maintained by the Venezuelan government, which is concerning given that some detainees present in this facility may be fleeing Venezuela because of persecution by the Venezuelan government. There is a second immigration detention facility located at a repo which houses multiple nationalities. The conditions in this facility have been described as incredibly unsanitary and inhumane, and we have received reports of detainees being housed in that facility for up to eight years. The government has not been transparent with regards to immigration detention. The number of persons in immigration detention is not shared with the public. CCHR and other stakeholders have requested access unsuccessfully to monitor immigration detention facilities. There have been reports in May of this year where female migrants had complained that they were victims of sexual abuse and poor living conditions at the heliport. Detainees have complained of the poor quality of food and water, cramped conditions, and inadequate medical conditions. Additionally, migrants in detention facilities are often not allowed to contact relatives. Recent reports, however, suggest that the state is detaining and deporting persons and not allowing persons to be released on an order of supervision, which is an alternative to detention. Some persons are returned via voluntary repatriation. However, it is unclear if they agree to do this with the support of an interpreter and if they are fully apprised of what they are agreeing to. 
Persons who are deported or voluntarily repatriated are being required to pay a bond for their release and are also required to pay for the ticket for their return. The bond is supposed to be refundable, but once migrants and refugees are returned, it may not be possible to retrieve that sum. Immigration detention in Trinidad and Tobago, it may be argued, is tantamount to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. A number of protection concerns as a consequence of Trinidad and, Trinidad and Tobago's border policies arise. Because of no legal framework to deal with asylum seekers and refugees, persons seeking asylum are forced to take irregular routes to seek protection, which exposes them to risky situations and increases their protection issues. They rely on smugglers and traffickers, which exposes already vulnerable persons to a number of protection issues and to extremely dangerous situations and persons. Women and girls especially face the risk of gender-based violence at the hands of smugglers and traffickers. Children are also detained indefinitely in immigration detention, which is in conflict with the best interests of the child principle. Children are also returned to their country of origin without, without having their protection needs assessed. When migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees are deported, there have been instances where families were separated, with some members being returned to Venezuela and some members being left behind in Trinidad and Tobago. The imposition by the state on deportees and returnees to, lay, to pay both a bond and the cost of, of the ticket to return is a tremendous burden, which they cannot, many cannot afford given their vulnerable status. If they are unable to pay Excuse for their Annie. return, Hello? We, we have to share the time. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. If they're unable to pay for their return, they are threatened with further detention. Uh, I will I will close, I will just leave it there. Thank you very much. Buenos dias, señora Presidenta. Good morning, Madam President and other members of the Inter-American Commission and the Executive Secretary. My name is Belisa Guerrero from Amnesty International. And in my intervention, I will talk about the intersectional ways of discrimination, including gender, nationality, and race. Uh, especially for those who seek international protection in countries such as Colombia, Peru, Trinidad and Tobago, and the United States. Taking into consideration gender-based violence and discrimination, according to investigations by in Amnesty International, we see that this discrimination occurs in transit destination and origin countries. In Trinidad and Tobago and Colombia, we have documented this violence and we have also identified cases of xenophobia and also specific acts of violence against the body of women. We have documented three Venezuelan women who have sought asylum, they suffer gender violence, which is manifested through sexual violence and human trafficking and work exploitation. Also, when women survive violence in their destination countries, there are no mechanisms for their protection, and they are not able to report those situations because these women do not know where to go when they suffer this type of violence, and sometimes they fear reporting this. And it's important to highlight that state agents, including police officers and medical personnel, uh, conduct their role in a very deficient way. And therefore, many women are left unprotected. In Peru, in Colombia, and in Ecuador, there are no specific shelters for women who are survivors of those type of violence. Taking into consideration discrimination based on race in the United States, um, we have the application of Title 42, which violates the rights of seek, um, asylum seekers, especially ra race um, asylum seekers. Even though Title 42 includes a section on ethnicity, we see that this specific legislation impacts Afro-descendants. Also, taking into consideration the recent report of Amnesty International, uh, International regarding Haitians, we see that Haitians are deported in mass without any respect for international protection legislation. And they also suffer ill treatment because of their migration uh, situation and their race. When we interviewed people for this research, these people report that they have no access to phone calls or to legal assistance or interpreters. Also, they were not provided regarding their rights. 
regarding ill treatment and torture suffered by Haitians in U.S. detention centers, we see that uh, people report lack of medical attention, lack of interpreters, lack of legal assistance. And also all the interviewer, all the people interviewed for this research uh, described that they were handcuffed. Also, there was a case in which a U.S. officer detained illegally three pregnant women without evaluating their protection needs. All these women were handcuffed and also minors were detained for between nine and 14 days and their mothers also were handcuffed. Also, these minors were separated from their mothers and this violates the best interest of the child principle. Therefore, the application of Title 42 is a practice that leads to the exclusion and violation of ethnic persons that is not only against Haitians, persons, but also Venezuelans who are seeking international protection in the U.S. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Dear, Dear honorable commissioners and audience, I present to you today as an impacted individual of the anti-Blackness that affects all Black people in mobility seeking protection. I am a joint legal fellow with the Haitian Bridge Alliance and Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. I am also the co-founder of the Camara Advocacy Network. Our coalition works on the front lines at the US-Mexico border and in immigration detention centers across the United States to defend the human rights of black people in mobility seeking protection. This work is particularly important to me personally because I'm a black migrant and myself was once a person in mobility seeking for protection across the Americas to the United States. I was forced to flee my home country in Cameroon 2017 after experiencing persecution based on my political opinion. I traveled through 11 countries by bus, plane, on, and on foot through the Darien Gap. On this journey, I almost died from malaria, attacks from gangs in Colombia and wild animals in the Darien Gap. I, I went several days through the jungle with no food, escaping and avoiding capture by Panamanian um, officials. In every country I traveled through in the Americas, I experienced harassment and profiling based on my race and immigration status. After three months of traveling, I finally made it to the United States Mexico border where I requested for asylum. But instead of being released to my family and friends and sponsors, I was incarcerated and detained by US immigration officials. First, I was held at the CBP facility in San Diego, California, and then I was transferred to and from different facilities um, while waiting for my asylum hearing. In detention, I experienced inhumane conditions, discriminatory treatment, reactions, and insults from de detention officials. However, in August 2019, I had my asylum hearing before an immigration judge, not being given the opportunity to access legal representation. I represented myself pro se and I won my asylum case. I was finally released from ICE detention. You know, there are several concerns about anti-Blackness and double standards affecting Black people in mobility. Firstly, the United States border policies operate to create a racial double standard, subjecting Black asylum seekers to mass expulsion while providing favorable treatment to asylum seekers from non-majority black countries like Ukraine. For example, between March of 2022 and May of 2022, Haitians were subjected to Title 42 at a rate 40 times higher than their Ukrainian counterparts under um, the expedited removal process of the United States um, laws. The United States government is required to ensure that people are not processed for deportation without an opportunity to apply for asylum. However, this screening process is flawed in ways that disproportionately affects black asylum seekers, leading to uh, the referral of these people in mobility who fear persecution from their home countries without giving them access to protection. Secondly, the United States uses border militarization and state violence to deter migrants from seeking asylum. The humanitarian crisis in Rio last, last year um, of 2021 is just one example of this tactic. It's in September 2021, at least 15,000 Black migrants, majority Haitians, were held by US border officials in a makeshift encampment at the Rio. These people were severely abused, beaten, staff, denied medical care before being summarily expelled to Haiti without access to US asylum process. To date, as we speak, there has been no accountability for the human rights abuses and violations against these Black people at the border seeking for protection. Thirdly, in order to punish and deter arriving asylum seekers, especially those from majority black countries, the United States government uses harsh detention at the US-Mexico border 
followed by transfers into detention facilities in the interior of the country. CBP and ICE and private prison companies jointly operate a national network of detention facilities with carceral conditions identical to that of US maximum security prisons and jails. Black migrants and immigrants detained by ICE face harshest conditions for the longest periods of time. They are routinely denied release and are required to pay disproportionately high amounts of bonds. For example, myself, I was issued a bond of 17,000 500 US dollars, whereas my cellmate was issued a bond of 1,500 after be, after submitting less identifying documents and special documents than I did. So in addition to that, the Black Immigrants Bail Fund, which I am the coordinator for, has paid bonds as high as 50,000 US dollars for Black people, which is uncomparable to that low amounts that are being paid to non-Black migrants. Black detained people are also subjected to racist, excessive force, abuses, and retaliations. For example, Black migrants are six times more likely to be sent back into society, to be sent into society confinement than other detained populations. Together, these border policies block Black migrants in mobility from accessing safety and protection. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Muchas gracias. Dear commissioners, my name is Hernandez Llano, and I'm leader of the Inter-American Network of Defense of Persons in a Context of Mobility. And I'd like to present our concerns regarding today's hearing topic. I would like to say that our organization is committed to protect people so that rights of mobility are respected and so that international proceedings are conducted regard, uh, following international standards. Our organization is seeking to find quick responses to protection needs. Uh, the UNCHR has signed a commitment so that the organization is able to participate. What we are doing is to create best practices in police in the borders to guarantee the human rights of persons in human mobility in the region. I would like to explain some of the experiences of our organization. In the case of Dominican Republic, we are concerned about the situation of Haitians and pregnant women who arrive to the borders because they have no, uh, their uh, requests for asylum are not being accepted. We are seeing that they suffer inadequate living conditions in those detention centers at the borders. In Ecuador, we would like to highlight the high number of cases in which there is no legal proceeding and there is a high level of discretionality and therefore there is no objective analysis of the need for protection and therefore these persons are subjected to human trafficking and other risks. In other countries, we see that there are delays regarding the processing of the migration status regardless of the concerns uh, regarding uh, the situation of persons in human mobility, we can highlight best practices, such as a program in the border of Brazil that is aimed at helping girls, boys, and women. And also there is an early alert system in Ecuador in order to monitor the population located at the north border of the country. Also in Argentina, the public prosecutor office has a program to guarantee and aid for migrants and asylum seekers at the borders. And also they have identified practices that lead to um, summary deportations, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, we have the Public Prosecution Office of Mexico who is trying to analyze the situation of migrants in the country. And they have extended the help to migrants in the country. Thank you. I think that you have not heard me. I just wanted to let you know, just stop the clock, please. I would like to uh, tell you that civil society has exceeded their time and you had a second round to present your presentations, your interventions. What we wanted is that your presentation was not like that, just running. I'm saying this again, and we'll call upon civil society 
to handle their time in a better way because otherwise some people end up talking more than others and they end up running. So when you receive any instructions, you're not listening to us. So now I would like to give the floor to the different commissioners. And first, I would like to give the floor to the first, uh, second, uh, first vice president, Eduardo Rolón, if she, he has any questions. Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, civil society representatives. More than posing questions, I actually had some comments to make. First of all, I wanted to thank, thank you for presenting, submitting all this information at this hearing, where this uh, human uh, drama, where human rights for migrant persons are not respected, is regional. It's expanded all throughout the region. We have heard today all the work that organizations have been doing in different points, different parts of the region. This is something that helps us here at the Commission to be able to make visible this sort of situations and this, all your inputs are very valuable to us. I wanted to highlight several points of information, but specifically I wanted to refer to Mr. Mr. Beneco's um, description, who clearly defined the situation of the differentiated impact of the situation of, of, of deportations on women. Uh, deportations between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, we saw that differentiated impact in other countries such as in Trinidad and Tobago or in Peru or in Ecuador and Colombia uh, with regard to Venezuelan women. This is an extremely serious situation which has even resulted in persons being detained in hospital centers or persons who cannot be deported are actually deported, actually endangering the life and health of persons in those situations. So I found very interesting and important to really see that differentiated impact approach here. I wanted to urge organizations to submit any sort of information, written information that you may have on those cases to the commission. So that will be my comment, thanking you. And we reiterate the commitment of the commission to continue making visible this serious situation with regard to migrant persons with this differentiated impact in su such groups of the society. Thank you. I give the floor to uh, Commissioner uh, Berhold Hernandez, the Rapporteur for Persons in Human Mobility. Thank you, Madam President. First, I wanted to really acknowledge the work you do as civil society organizations for the rights of human uh, migrants, and also to make a comment of the situation of people in mobility today. First of all, I want to congratulate you for all your work. I really thank you for having come to this here in this uh, regional ex officio hearing convened by the Commission, because it's very important for the Commission, all the, all the testimonies you present here since the commission is uh, right now drafting several thematic reports on this topic and what you are submitting is valuable and, and key. Also, I encourage you to send all the information you have on the, on the situation that you may observe at a national and regional level to the executive secretariat because your contributions are extremely valuable as input for us. Also, I wanted to highlight the importance of the work you do as human rights defenders. The United Nations Special Rapporteur for Persons Defenders of Human Rights have just issued a report that addresses your work specifically, the work of human rights defenders of migrant rights and among many of the things that are highlighted in that report, we see the situations of danger that the persons face, even members of uh, human rights organizations 
just for being in solidarity with migrant persons. So here I wanted to acknowledge your work. Second, I agree with you. In such a complex outlook that we see in our region today in the framework of migration, this great goal presented by the international community in December 2018 by agreeing, by adopting the Global Compact on Migration, which is to achieve a safe, orderly and regular migration has not been met. And I am very much concerned with this because we are seeing some more complex scenarios than those that existed in 2018 when the international community created a, an agreement, a compact that contains the principles, the basic principles to govern migration. We're very far from meeting those goals and we are seeing this in very concrete examples. For example, this is part of the mapping of the commission. We know the huge exodus of Venezuelan nationals, which reaches 7.8 million persons that have exited their country. We have closely monitored the, the movement of Central Americans of the North part that are going to Mexico with the final aim of reaching the United States. At the moment, we also documented the Nicaraguan migrations that has started since the crisis in 2018. And with the OHCHR data, we see that in this number may reach 100,000 persons, most of them going to Costa Rica. We also saw uh, an upsurge of mi Mexican migration, Haitian, Cuban migration, and as it was said here, African migration. Persons that are moving in Central America and Mexico with uh, the aim of reaching the United States. Also in the United States, we are noticing an unprecedented increase in the number of migration detentions. As I understand, we are uh, reaching record figures around 800,000 persons that have detained in one year. So we notice that migration today is has several reasons. One of those reasons continues being persons leaving their territories due to political repression, the closure of civil and democratic spaces, but also most of migrants migrate due to poverty. And we are starting to see this linked to persons leaving territories that are affected by climate conditions. So I have to be very brief because I don't want to take up too much time from the special rapporteur Soledad Garcia Muñoz, who is precisely studying these aspects of this uh, economic, social, cultural, and environmental conditions of migration. So I see three levels of protections needed. One has to do with asylum seekers. Another one that was clearly identified in Latin America, which is complementary protection. And there's a thread, a third dimension, which is mainly made up of most migrants, which has to do with migration uh, on the basis of economic reasons. And here, I believe that there has not been uh, an international community's reaction that is appropriate and in line with the needs of this third dimension. The regulations in terms of migrants at an international level has been consolidated and covers all aspects of migration right now. But I do feel, nevertheless, that it's very necessary to focus on that migration, which is based on economic issues. Of course, there are national efforts and we cannot leave them aside. Recently, the United States announced a program of 20, 29,000 visas for Venezuelans that may come directly to the United States from Venezuela without exposing themselves to move through other territories that are other regional 
efforts, but I see there is a lack of a great regional agreement where there is a shared responsibility, but differentiated responsibility according to the place that each country uh, occupies in this spectrum of migration, whether they are destination countries or migration or transit uh, countries or return countries. The Inter-American Commission, as you very well know, because this is an instrument that you use on a daily basis, in December 2019 adopted the Inter-American Principle for the Rights of All Persons in human mobility. This instrument compiles inter-American inter standards on this matter. And there's a fundamental principle that it, we should highlight, which is principle 58. In this principle, we see the guarantees in regularization processes for migration. It's very important that countries, as part of this responsibility, take into account the importance of moving forward in this process of regular, regularization, because when there is no pro progress on that and migration increases, we see an abuse on the part of uh, human traffickers. And this is where the risk of losing life increases for these persons. Just a final comment before I wrap up. Someone mentioned the importance of the fact that the commission should draft a regional report. We are working several of those, but I find important that the commission should have a regional approach, a comprehensive approach of what is happening today in our region. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I give the floor to Commissioner Bernal. Thank you very much, Madam President. I also second Commissioner Hernandez's comments. I want to thank and congratulate the courageous civil society representatives that are submitting this information today. I would like to also second uh, Commissioner Hernandez's comments and request uh, to uh, request civil society representatives to expand on some issues. I believe the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights mandate must be adjusted to time and to new challenges. We must have new solutions in the face of new challenges. So far, the Inter-American Commission's approach in the face of each human rights problem has been a bilateral approach. For example, several persons stated the information as regards circumstances, for example, the return of Argentinians in Mexican airports or problems of due process faced by migrants in Chile. And they also mentioned much more complex issues that I see, I define with two words. One is regional and two structural. So structural and regional issues. For some time, I've had this idea, which is that this commission, despite it, on top of producing reports and determining standards, which is very good, it must play or comply with a role that must be much more active as regards solving those structural and regional issues as a sort of hub or a center to coordinate dialogue or actions between states that suffer those structural and regional problems. Those are a bit abstract as ideas, so I would like to know if any civil society representatives have any more concrete ideas that help us think of new ways of innovating to be much more effective in reaching regional and structural solutions. I think the greatest challenge of our region is migration. Commissioner Hernandez brought this very important idea to this table of discussion, which is not all states are in the same circumstances in the face of, of migration, but there is a great prevailing issue as regards poverty. So we should request from states to act on that matter. So I wanted to see if you have any ideas on on this issue.
Thank you, Commissioner Bernal. I have some very specific questions. As regards Colombia, I want to know, with regards to the temporary status of protection, have you assessed what the impact was be beyond having said that this was very positive? What was really the impact of this to see if this could be a good practice? You also mentioned the case of women generally and also pregnant women in Haiti more particularly. So what is happening in the cases of women who give birth in the country they are be uh, in transit or as a destination? What is happening to those children they give birth to? Maybe this depends on legislation, but are there any actions or public policies to protect those children that are born in, in the way of these migrant women? And on the other hand, the issue of human trafficking, because this is a hearing with regard to human mobility and the risk of human trafficking is enormous, huge, specifically for women. In a previous hearing, we found cases of Venezuelan women who were forced to be included in human trafficking networks. Here with Juan Carlos Pacheco, I. We also saw the service as regards uh, evictions. When migrants are evicted, women usually were subjected to sexual violence to avoid those ev evictions. So I want to know if you had seen, beyond mentioning uh, women, if you had seen these differences in terms of gender, for example, in access to economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights, or if you had seen anything as regards uh, gender-based violence, also with regard to uh, the LGBTIQ community. Finally, I agree with Commissioner Bernal, and I think it's important to see what responses you can give, knowing what's the mandate of the commission, because there's a mandate that is different for different uh, OES bodies. Having said this, I give the floor to Secretary Maria Claudia Pulido and then to Special Rapporteur Soledad Garcia Munoz. Thank you very much. I join all the congratulations and the thank yous for the information that we received, but I wanted to give some, to, to, to receive some points of information from the regional perspective, taking into account the structural elements, it's important to highlight resolution 2, 2021, which the commission issued as regards the crisis of Haitian human mobility, which calls to this principle of solidarity on the parts of states to address the inflow of migration. Also, I wanted to underscore that the, all the information that you're submitting today is extremely valuable to draft the practical guidelines on borderline and the protection of human rights of persons in human mobility, which is right now being developed in, an, in a strategic alliance the Commission has with the OHCHR. Also, the Commission is working in two regional reports, first on the situation of persons, Venezuelan persons in human mobility in the region, which has to do with the causes of that mobility and the crisis of human rights in Venezuela and the migrate, migration situation of different countries of the region. And we're also working on a report on the regional protection of persons in context of human mobility in the center and north of the Americas, which also includes uh, the origin, transit, and destination countries and return countries as well. So those were two points of information so that organizations of civil society knew of the work that we are conducting and that we can work in the future jointly to continue making this matter visible. Thank you, Maria Claudia. I give the floor to uh, the Special Rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Munoz. Thank you, Madam President. Sorry for the delay. I could not unmute myself. I would like to greet all the participants at this hearing and especially to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. For sure, um, the comments of the commissioners are aligned with what our rapporteurship is observing. We have chosen a line on human mobility and economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. 
because we live in the most unequal and most dangerous region of the country, uh, facing a very serious climate um, emergency. According to Resolution 321, also a pandemic and that has um, increased the need of people of moving. And therefore we are trying to establish the relationships between economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights and human mobility. Not only thinking of the rights of persons in human mobility, but also so thinking about the causes that lead to human mobility. For example, in resolution 121, we address how the CLAC has identified that uh, the higher number of droughts, floods, and climate crisis have led to massive internal displacements and international displacements. And therefore, the situation is more and more critical. And therefore, we need to have a more comprehensive perspective and we need more sensitive public policies and taking into consideration the decrease in migration and mobility flows. So therefore, my question is aimed at the following. What are the trends that you are identifying in terms of human mobility when we consider economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights and human mobility? And also I would like to say that we are drafting a report on poverty, inequality, and climate change in Central America in Mexico. We will be presenting very soon a questionnaire um, and I would like to invite all organizations here, if you have relevant informa information, we invite you to share it. Thank you. Now, uh, civil society will have uh, your time to participate. You have three minutes, additional minutes. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Juan Carlos Pacheco. I'm here on behalf of Hayas. I'm, I'm talking today on behalf of R4B platform. The situation of Venezuelans became worse due to the measures taken because of COVID-19 pandemic, because of the position of new migration requirements, the changes in asylum uh, systems, and therefore this forced the population to take dangerous routes, which are controlled by criminal organizations and illegal actors. The human mobility situation in the region showed that their needs are not being taken into consideration and that this goes beyond documentation. Therefore, the R4B platform has documented, analyzed the following emerging risks of protection. Venezuelans are exploited sexually and in the labor market by illegal armed groups and crime organizations in countries of origin, destination, and transit. And we see that this affects the right to life, integrity, and security. Um, also, they are suffer torture and there are cases of disappearance. Sometimes these criminal organizations provide them with food and transfer, but then the victims need to pay with sexual exploitation and labor exploitation. We see that these people work in illegal mining projects, illegal agriculture projects in different countries of the region. Access to justice is limited because of the low cap uh, capacity of the judiciary and the lack of um, um, care for them. Also, there is a lack of trust and this deepens the crisis. Border policies also have disproportionate impacts on specific groups, including LGBTI persons, transgender women, especially, who have suffered threats, persecution, harassment by police officers and members of criminal organizations. They have no access to justice or to health services. Women in transit who are home leaders uh, face serious risks since they do not comply with the requirements for regular entry, and therefore they suffer several human rights violations. 
those girls, boys and adolescents who travel with their parents face risks of sexual violence and sexual exploitation. Also, we have identified effects in mental health. Also, we need to find new reunification or family reunification processes. Otherwise, there will be more effects uh, because of these minors that are not are separated from their families. Young people reported that they have no programs that are adequate to their needs. Their demands on mental health are not being heard. And also, uh, we see that um, there could be an increase of violations in border zones. Also, there are also the purchase and sale of indigenous people for illegal mining and illegal agriculture. They are sent to the interior of the country. And sometimes there has been no prior consultation regarding the processes to help indigenous communities in mobility. So we call upon the governments to develop programs to guarantee the assistance and to protect people from illegal and criminal organizations. We call upon states to continue monitoring resolution 419. Also to provide guidance. We want the commission to provide guidance to a state regarding how to provide guarantees regarding access to the territory and also we would like to call up on the commission to conduct an in local visit to Central American countries, especially Mexico, to address, analyze the situation and the impacts of the new migration policy. Also, we would like the commission to call up on states to identify routes of migration and to identify risks in border areas. Thank you so much, commissioners. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the Commission for this space. I'm Jocelyn Gutierrez. I'm from the Mexican Commission for the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights. I would like to say that the Mexican migration policy is facing a new crisis and accessing to the condition of refugee is being affected. There are migration measures that are regressive. For example, in January 2022, an agreement was published and therefore there is a visa, visa requirement for Venezuelans, and therefore they have no permit to conduct work activities. So they are considered tourists. And also there is an increase, an increasing number of Venezuelans who request a visa for tourism, but then they end up working and therefore they are in an irregular migration situation. And there are different fake requests uh, of visa. And also they are forced to commit crimes. Um, according to the state, these were the reasons to establish a visa requirement to all Venezuela nationals. This resolution is happening in spite of the fact that since 2018, we see that the situation of violations of human rights in Venezuela has been recognized by the international community. And therefore, the UNHCR has called upon states to provide international protection to Venezuelans. In Mexico, nationals of Venezuela who need international protection and recognized as refugees. However, this agreement that I mentioned before is a barrier to be recognized as a refugee. And therefore, Venezuelans cannot entry in a regular way to the country unless people request asylum before traveling to Mexico. And therefore, Venezuelans are not able to comply with the requirements to process their visa, sometimes visa. There are also several economic barriers to this. Also, we see that people face a high risk of being returned to their country without considering their fact that their security and physical integrity are at risk in Venezuela. Also, the UN Rapporteurship for Migrants has recognized that these measures do not protect migrants. Rather, they have damaging effects on their rights. 
In this context, it is also important to mention the collaboration between the governments of Mexico and the United States in terms of migration policies. This means that there is an externalization of borders, and this has led to restrictive measures that are go against human rights. For example, this includes Title 42 and the programs such as Quedate in Mexico. Um, now, there is a new stage of these restrictive measures that include restrictions for Venezuelans. After the, the Department of Security of the US, the DHS, announced on October the 12th that Venezuelans are crossing the south border irregularly, and if they do so, they will be returned to Mexico. This regulation was applied in spite of the fact that the number of migrants from Venezuela that arrived to the border between Mexico and the US is high. And you know that this number has increased in recent years. Therefore, this measure is trying to reduce these rates and to disencourage the number of Venezuelans at the border. And therefore, Venezuelans are prevented from entering the border or from requesting a regular entry into the United States. Also, we see that a huge number of people will be excluded from any benefits if these persons have crossed the border through Panama or Mexico after October the 12th, 2022. Therefore, the Mexican government has no possibility of guaranteeing the rights of Venezuelans. And also it has established a specific requirements such as the visa requirement. Therefore, those people who are requesting international protection, they cannot enter to Mexico in a regular manner. Thank you. I would like to give the floor to my colleagues so that they can answer the questions of the commission. Thank you. My name is Dio Morales. I'm from CELS, Argentina. Again, We'd like to thank you for this opportunity and for giving us two extra minutes to have a discussion. We would like now to start with our round of comments. Each organization will have two minutes to participate. The commission is facing a, co a challenge that it has to do with the situation of different migrants and asylum seekers that travel through the region, it's important to mention that human rights organizations and protection organizations are facing challenges, especially in terms of the challenges faced by public institutions as well. Um, the Association of Public Defenders of the Region has presented some information in this regard. What we would like to highlight is that uh, there is something important that the commission said. If you recall, last year's hearing regarding the militarization of borders, the Inter-American Commission issued a press release that was very significant, very symbolic. It did not solve the issue, but it helped us to give some context to the discussions that we have at a national level. Um, I would like to highlight that press release because at the national level, our organizations are able to have some discussions also, we are doing a trans-border work. We are trying to work together with organizations from other countries to think of common strategies because these strategies at the borders or airports prevent the right to defense. So therefore we need to articulate our work between destination countries and countries of origin. And also there's another challenge that was mentioned by the commission that it has to do with the rights of migrants and the rights of international protection for refugees and asylum seekers. And what we are seeing is that there are some state responses that are being overlapped. Sometimes the states tell us that it's not necessary to access to the system of asylum of international protection because the migration system is better. But in practice, what happens is that there are huge barriers to those persons who are not requesting asylum they have to face a lot of issues and a lot of barriers in the migration processes in those countries. And that is very important. And also we need to take into consideration the guidance of the UN in terms of protection of human rights 
in border areas. And the commission mentioned this. So maybe the commission should take into consideration this document and include some commitments on the side of the states. I would like to give the floor to other organizations. Thank you, Diego. I'd like to begin my intervention and to be very brief to respect the times of other organizations. I would like to answer one of the questions of the president of the organization regarding the situation of girls, boys, and adolescents. In our organization, we have a project that is called Nationality or Nacionalidad. We have the support of the UNHCR, and we work together with other organizations, especially those in Colombia. And we address the situation of boys, girls, and adolescents who are born in transit. They are, for example, from Venezuelan or Colombian parents. And we are seeing that this is happening in Colombia and other countries, especially Chile as well. And taking into consideration what the commissioner says regarding the need to have instances of dialogue, I think that the situation of migrant children, we have an urgent need since many of these girls and boys reach their destination countries without any documents. And they are at risk of being stateless. And there are several vulnerabilities that they suffer. We can send you specific information that we have collected through our project. I also would like to talk about the topic of uh, this hearing that has to do with border policies and taking into consideration our experience in Chile. Uh, we believe that border policies in the region uh, have to do with exclusion, reconduction and exclusion. And therefore, um, there is no consideration of having a humanitarian and human rights perspective at the border, especially there is a discrimination against some vulnerable populations in the country of origin and in the countries of destination as well. And to conclude, I'd like to say that it is fundamental that civil society organizations can coordinate their work. And we would like to thank the commission for their work we need your support so that our border policies protect the situation of persons in human mobility. And so that we are able to start solving some of the pro pro uh, problems that were identified in, at this hearing. Thank you. First of all, we are from the litigation ne network on migration, and we would like to propose to the commission that in light of the situations that have been described at this hearing, um, in which we can determine that international protection is part of a human right, I think that our intervention should be considered in the drafting of the regional report. This is an initiative that we celebrate and we will be paying a specific attention to this in order to collaborate in the drafting of that report. Also, we consider that in light of the seriousness of the situation and the cases, cases that have been described by the different participating organizations, it would be good that the commission evaluates the possibility of providing ex officio precautionary measures to safeguard the lives of those persons that are at risk in the different borders of the region. And also, we would like to request that the rapporteurship on the rights of migrants and the plenary of the commission issues a press release after the end of the period of sessions in order to call upon the state of Colombia and other states of the region on recommendations regarding the principle of non refoulement and the right to seek asylum and refugee and being refugee. And also, this is a way to guarantee due process of law, so, uh, um, the access to a due process and also to have access to legal assistance and to have access to interpreters and also so that the conditions during the proceeding are guaranteed for these migrants and refugees. Also, we would like to work together with executive secretariat to develop more on this matter. And regarding the Institute for Venezuelan Migrants, we believe that this is a good initiative. However, we need to consider that there should be no exclusion regarding those persons that have a need for international protection. Due process of law should be complied with. Different organizations so far have identified that there are a lot of problems with the times defined by the statute. And sometimes the documents that are issued have a lot of flaws and we need now those documents to be corrected. 
So it has been a good initiative. The estate has been a good initiative, but some adjustments need to be made. And I think that one of the issues that the state of Colombia is facing right now has to do with integration. So we would like to mention two things. First, anything that has to do with implementation of the statute. We have identified several barriers regarding access uh, and the way in which uh, documents are being issued. And secondly, regarding the um, development of the statute, there are some resolutions or clauses that discourage access to um, protection. And sometimes people need to um, continue without international protection in order to have a resolution on their migration status. And therefore, we are really concerned that this is a barrier to access to international protection. Thank you so much. Thank you, colleagues. What we want to do, or we, what, what we want to request to the commissioners, we would like to call upon US, US to stop using the category of deportation because uh, women, pregnant women, adolescent migrants, and also descendants of migrants. And in the Dominican Republic, because of a sentence of the Constitutional Court, this category includes all these persons, and this should be changed. And also, we need the state to comply with the obligations that it has to protect persons that are requesting international protection. We need the Dominican Republic to establish a specific regime for migrants and to protect due, law, the due process of law. Uh, and to stop with detentions. And also it's necessary that the, sta the state stops with massive deportations of Haitians. And also um, we need that uh, Dominica, uh, persons from Dominican Republic of Haitian origin have their documentation. Also, we need to find new ways in order to guarantee the release of persons which are detained at the border. And also, we need to uh, change the definition of transborder inhabitant. And also, this, there should be a new policy at the three points of entry between Haiti and Dominican Republic. We see that the current policies that not promote regulated migration. Thank you so much. <clears throat> the Caribbean Center for Human Rights urges the Commission to request a visit to Trinidad and Tobago to meet with the Minister of National Security to assess the border policies of Trinidad and Tobago and to request a visit to monitor the conditions in immigration detention. We once again re reiterate the call for the international community to urge the government of Trinidad and Tobago to establish a refugee policy or a legal framework to guide the management of arrivals of migrants and refugees to Trinidad and Tobago. We also urge the government of Trinidad and Tobago to strengthen its cooperation with the various stakeholders engaged in the response to the arrivals of refugees and migrants to develop a safer, more humane and coordinated system to manage migration in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Sobre los procesos de regularización As regards regularization processes in the region, we are here we are submitting a study that we drafted an analysis that is in comparison from a legal perspective on nine current processes of regularization where we see the good practices and the voids that we observe including the regularization process in colombia that was mentioned by other colleagues which forces persons to reject to, to refuse international protection and creates this sort of limbos and legal voids that 
make this population vulnerable. And also we observe the sort of voids, not only in Colombia, but in other countries in the regularization processes. And of course, we are here available to share with the commission all the documents and information that we have on the situations that we presented today. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Adeline and I will send you the um, Amnesty International petition. We mentioned this, but it's fundamental that the commission urges the state to protect and grant access, effective access to protection systems, systems without discrimination to all migrants according to the Convention on the Status of Refugees and the Cartagena uh, Convention, and also in line with other regularization systems. Also, we request the Commission to urge states to guarantee that police and migration authorities have solid uh, systems to non-discriminate and to address specific needs of women migrants and survivors of uh, gender-based violence. Also, that the United States ceases to implement Title 42 and to open uh, an investigation of on racism against Afro-descendants and Black persons uh, when they are migrants. Also, we request to cease the detention of human rights that uh, from Haiti so that the crisis is not uh, deepened. As regards the question, we have some information points to submit, but our time has run out, so we are available to send this via writing. In line with previous interventions, I wanted to highlight the need that the Commission should request states to, to respect the non refoulement principle and to grant protection and to the state the status of refugees to persons of mobility. The Commission added the two additional minutes. Could you confirm, Lucia, please, if you added that time to the clock? Just a moment, I want to check. Well, in any case, I'm, I'm granting two minutes if you have any more comments. So, Thank you, Madam President. The Mexican Commission wanted to add a petition to the Commission so that they create a specific uh, follow-up mechanism to the recommendations that ha they have issued as regards the protection of persons in human mobility in the region with the aim of guaranteeing a regional follow-up to consider the serious situation in which these persons find themselves and the several vulnerable uh, infringements of human rights that we presented in our interventions. Thank you. Thank you so much. As Commissioner Bernard um, noted, migration is the greatest challenge that the, um, the Commission is facing right now. There's never been a more urgent time for the Commission to act and intervene on this issue. And of course, we commend the Commission for working on a, on a regional report. However, we strongly urge the Commission to use every tool that it has at its disposal. This includes petitions, case system, protective measures, and working visits. Uh, for example, we urge the Commission to visit the U.S.-Mexico border to monitor mass expulsion and these discriminatory deniers um, uh, that affects the entry of Black migrants, as well as the inhumane detention centers uh, and conditions. Also, uh, during the Dario crisis, we noted that and observed dozens of women and, and young babies as old as one day that were deported. However, there has been no accountability. As some, of these, some of these babies are citizens of um, other Central American countries because they were being born in transit. So um, with your important transactional and hemispheric mandate, the commission um, could you know, intervene here. It has the ability to shape and push for a meaningful and desperately needed change um, in these policies, starting from the original report and the above um, recommendations I mentioned, which includes working visits and uh, also visits at the border petition and case systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are wrapping up with this hearing. So as my colleagues have said, and I'm speaking on behalf of the whole team of the commission, I'm thanking you 
very much for the information that you submitted today and your participation. And also we request and we say that you can perfectly send all the written information you have via, uh, at, to the commission. Of course, you also have the space to be here, but we also want to congratulate for the work you do on a daily basis. This hearing is seen, it's been seen by many persons, internal displacement, uh, victims, migrants, refugees, persons in any sort of human mobility, and you have brought their voices here. We take note of all the requests regarding visits, the regional report, press releases, precautionary measures, etc. We are drafting our plan of action for next year and all of these requests can be included so that they may be implemented in the future. Also, I wanted to comment uh, since Diego uh, mentioned this, I, I'm seeing many persons that I've seen in other hearings and I, and I have seen in different cases, for example, in, in Paraguay recently, or in environments related to thematic uh, reports or visits to countries. And this speaks of the comprehensiveness of protection of human rights, the importance of the continuous work that you conduct. I want to really thank each and every one of you. I don't know all of you, but I know Daniel brought his own story and what migration of Afro population means, but I was thinking that we all are in a sort of way migrants or will be migrants at some point. So what it's true here that even the con the story, the history of our countries has to do with migration. Persons that escaped a war in, in 1945 and came here to start working or those who because of economic crisis uh, left countries of the South. So this is not a recent problem or a problem of a specific population. And this is true with the structural issue, as Commissioner Bernal was saying. What we see is a, the reflection of a structural problem of inequality. And in the case of women and LGBTIQ persons, this is gender-based violence. Recently, the Inter-American Court issued its first advisory um, opinion number 29 on the persons deprived of the liberty and there's a paragraph where the court assesses how this uh, inequality situation and discrimination that may exist outside prison is also seen in penitentiary centers so I want to make this comparison all the discrimination and inequality that we see in our countries is reflected and is observed in migration issues the state State policies must be seen in this regional approach. So in that sense, the Inter-American Commission is and will always be available with this differentiated view. It's not the same what happens in Haiti, Colombia, Venezuela, Argentina, etc. But there is nevertheless a general concern. And Commissioner Hernandez is the rapporteur for migrants. And I was the, the rapporteur until next, last year. And we used to say that Human integrity does not depend on a visa or a passport. And this is what we want to achieve from our side. Thank you very much. I adjourn this hearing and we will continue working. Have a great day. Muchas gracias. Un gusto. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Gracias. Gracias. Gracias.